Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Laseka. I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee for BOAF, and we welcome you to this first part of the 2024 Florida Legislative Review. We're going to talk about a handful of bills on this first part, and then we are going to have a part two next week on Thursday, July the 18th at the same time. Joining me, Celeste Roman, who is making everything happen from her end electronically and the two vice chairs of the committee, Sergio Escunce from Miami-Dade County and Stephanie Rossi from Citrus County. And yes, they do grow some citrus over there. A couple of things on the presentation. Number one, this is copyrighted, so if you want to use anything with regard to the presentation, please submit your request to BOEF to use part of the information. Uh, this is being recorded, so people who do miss it will be able to review it at a later date. Uh, we are giving you the information best upon our best comprehension of it, and you should review the copy of the enrolled bill, which is now a statute with full details and related information. Now, we have submitted the session to ICC for educational credit, and all the attendees registered and provided all the information required and conform to the requirements for attendance, we'll have them submitted to ICC for educational credit. If you do have a question on the bottom of the link, you will see there's a little thing called Q&A. Please use that. We will be monitoring it, and all of the questions will be answered during that Q&A segment. If you have any other questions, raise your hand, and Celeste, in case you have a technical issue, they'll be happy to assist you with regards to that. Now, let's move along. First off is Sergio, and Sergio, are you ready to go? Ready, Ron. Okay, here we go on House Bill 267, which is building regulations. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, in this uh, review, we're gonna be looking at uh, the House Bill 267, uh, named Building Regulations. Um, we, this bill was signed by the governor on May 16th, 2024, and it will become effective on January 1st, 2025. So please make a note of that. This is not one of those bills that become, became effective on July 1st. Uh, it's becoming effective on January 1st. So in brief, the bill modifies the provisions of the Florida building code as it relates to replacement windows, doors, and garage doors. It also changes provisions relating to the private providers. It revises timeframes for permit issuance and revises timeframes for approving certain types of building permits. It authorizes local governments to use certain fees for technology upgrades and provides certain types of unvented attic assemblies. Next slide, please. Yes, hold on one sec. There we go. Thank you. So we're going to step through each section of the bill and we're going to identify the changes that the bill made to the specific uh, Florida statutes within it. So the first section uh, affects uh, sec uh, Florida Statute 468-609, which is the eligibility for certification as a building code uh, official. Now, it has added the residential inspector to the internship program as eligibility for recertification for certification. As uh, as you remember, in last year's bill it redefined a residential inspector, and so this year it was actually added to uh, the internship program as one of those paths that could be used for certification uh, through uh, BCAB. And which is which requires basically uh, eligibility of taking the ICC exam and coming in and uh, in the and taking a forty hour code class in the trade that sought. Next slide, please. So in section two, uh, it concerns the Florida Building Code, and in this change, uh, the law has changed as to requiring sealed drawings by design professionals for replacement of windows, doors, and garage doors in an existing one or two family dwelling or single family townhouse when it meets the following conditions. 
So the replacements are installed in accordance with manufacturer's instructions for the wind zone in question. Uh, replacements uh, meet the design pressure requirements in current Florida Building Code residential, and that's found in Table R301.2, uh, Paran 2, for the nine high velocity hurricane zone. Uh, manufacturer's instructions are submitted with the permit application, and replacements must be the same size and are installed in the same manner as the as the as the existing openings. So there is there has been for some time uh, tables in 301.2 that cover all the wind zones in the state of Florida. It also takes into consideration uh, factors for exposure B, exposure C, and exposure D, so that. Uh, resulting uh, pressures can be calculated. However, uh, those calculations, uh, along with any site-specific calculations, would have required a design professional to sign and seal. So now uh, that is no longer a requirement, as long as they follow these conditions as stipulated in the new law. Next, next slide, please. Section 3 changes Florida Statute 55379 which is titled Permits, Applications, Issuance, and Inspections. Uh, subsection 16 has been deleted in its entirety. Now, subsection 16 uh, had the original time frames of 45 days for an application process and 120 days for processing the actual application, and it allowed for tolling of that time frame. Uh, the new section 5, which we'll cover in the next few slides, has changed all those time frames, and uh, we'll, we'll see what those are. Next slide, please. Now, in section four, uh, that modifies uh, statute 553.791, and that's the alternative plan review and inspections, or the private provider provisions in law. The new laws, the new bill has added a definition for private provider firm. It establishes the firm as one of a variety of business organizations, which in, could include co corporations, partnerships, business trust, or any other legal entity. Uh, services are provided through licensees who act as agents, employees, officers, or partners of the, for, of the firm. And subsection 4C added fee owners contractor to the acknowledgement, which already was listed at the beginning of subsection 4. So I I think that was just added on for consistency. Next slide. Uh, in subsection nine, the word approximate is added before the word date. And that has the implication because previously the word approximate was before the, the word time, which meant that you had to provide a date, a date certain, but obviously the time during that date would have been an approximate. So with that switch, that means that there could be an approximate date and approximate time. Now, the second portion of the sentence uh, was stricken, which required inspections to be requested the prior business days before 2 p.m. Uh, now, this change would now allow same-day inspections uh, by the private provider. Uh, the private provider, however, must still request the inspection, and the building official can still perform uh, a site visit after the private provider has performed their inspection. Next slide. In subsection 10, changes the time frame for plan reviews of subsection 7, which deals with uh, the time frame for the 20 days. And this provision has changed when the plan compliance affidavit is sealed by a private provider who is an architect or engineer. So note that this provision does not include a building code administrator serving as a private provider, uh, who is actually one of the qualifications that can be a private provider. However, uh, this provision only applies to a signature and seal by an architect or engineer who's acting a private provider. Uh, subsection 7 provided for 20 days, 20 business days for review. But this section, however, modifies that to 10 business days. 
uh, unless you provide a specific reason or reasons and cite the code sections in writing as to why uh, approval cannot be issued. If uh, reasons and code sections are not provided within this time frame, the permit is issued as a matter of law and the building official must issue the permit on the next business day. If affidavit is not signed by the architect or engineer serving as a private provider, the time frame uh, reverts to what is in subsection seven, which is the 20 business days, meaning that if the uh, plan compliance affidavit is signed by a building code administrator, then the 20 business days is the one that applies. Next slide, please. In, uh, in the renumbered subsection 20 indicates that the private providers may not be audited until the local agency has created a standard operating private provider audit procedure for the agency inspection and review staff. The operating procedure must cover at the minimum the private provider audit purpose and scope, private provider audit criteria, an explanation of the private provider audit process and objections, and detailed findings of areas of noncompliance. Audits must be publicly available online and accessible by printed version in the agency's buildings, and audits must be posted online and available for the last two quarters. So the new provision states that a building official must develop a set of operating procedures before they can audit a private provider. So once you do have those procedures, then you can move forward and provide those audits However, if you don't have procedures, then you cannot perform those audits until then. Now, the same private provider or firm may not be audited more than four times a year. This was previously four times a month. Uh, unless there is an immediate threat to public safety and welfare, which must be communicated in writing to the private provider or firm. And now portions of a sentence stricken within this language previously invalidated the private provider's inspection if they did not request uh, their inspection in accordance with subsection 9. This further reinforces the ability for private providers to perform inspections or reinspections on the same day. In section 5, statute 553, 792. Now, this section, uh, this is the new section five for time frames that I spoke of, of at the beginning. And these time frames uh, are not related to private providers. This is, uh, in general, what apl applies across the boards to all permit applications uh, that meet these requirements within the building department. So, permit applications to a local government. The local government must result a permit application after receipt of a complete and sufficient application using local government plan reviews. Within 30 business days for structures less than 7,500 square feet on residential units, which include single family residence units or dwellings, accessory structures, alarm, electrical, irrigation, landscape, mechanical, plumbing, or roofing permits. 60 business days for structures that are 7,500 square feet or greater on residential units, which include single family residential units or dwellings, accessory structures, alarm, electrical irrigation, landscaping, mechanical plumbing, or roofing. Uh, 60 business days for signs or non-residential buildings that are less than 25,000 square feet. Next slide. 60 business days for multifamily residential, not exceeding 50 units. These are multifamily uh, buildings site plan approvals and subdivision plats not requiring public hearing or public notice and lot grading and site alterations. 12 business days for applications using a master building permit following statute 553-794 to obtain a site-specific uh, building permit. This is only applies to the site-specific, meaning that your master model should already be approved. So for every lot, that is using a master model, pre-approved master model. This applies to just the site-specific uh, requirements. 
And then 10 business days for single family residential dwelling applied for by a licensed contractor on behalf of a property owner who participates in the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program administered by the Department of Commerce. The local government may not require applicants waivers of timeframes as a condition president to reviewing a permit applications. And I know that I heard this in the past while this was being developed that, you know what, you know, when, when the applicant applies, they're going to sign a, 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 a form that says they're waiving their time. So this kind of overrides that. This does not allow it. So we, they, it causes us to adhere to the time frames adhere to uh, property rejecting a, uh, an application for cause, citing uh, code sections, and going through the process of re-reviews based on the timeframes that have been established in this new section. So the local government must meet the timeframe set forth herein unless the timeframes set by the local ordinance are more stringent. So if you have a local ordinance that actually is more stringent than this new law, then you are required to comply with your more stringent ordinance. It does not allow you to fall back to these, uh, the timeframes established by law. The local government has five business days to determine if an application is properly completed. Otherwise, the application is automatically deemed properly completed and accepted. And the last sentence of the original section 6C deletes the 45 days to determine the sufficiency of an application and the 120 days to process an application and the tolling thereof. So that, that was the original section that was deleted in its entirety that gave building departments a broader time frame to process these applications. So obviously the, the message here is uh, an expedited uh, type of review is being demanded of us. The original subsection 1B1 concerning the resubmittal timeframes has been replaced by a 10, 10 business day timeframe for the local government to review the revisions that correct an application for a permit. So this used to be part of that 120 days that you can toll and obviously you have more time for these re-reviews or the reworks that they call them uh, for an application that has been submitted with corrections. So now it's, it's down to 10 business day. If the local government fails to meet this time frame, the applicant is due a 20% reduction in permit fee. So here's the penalty. There are portions where it could be uh, 10%, but if in the real review process, if a government does not comply with the 10 day business, it is a 20%, not the 10%. So uh, to avoid reducing the permit by the other 10%, the government must provide in writing the reasons for denial and the applicant has 10 business days to, to resubmit uh, after which the application will be denied. So again, as long as the jurisdiction provides uh, the denial uh, comments in writing, citing the specific code sections very clearly, then there is no 10% uh, uh, penalty for that. In section six, this section affects statute 553.80, which is uh, titled enforcement. Uh, and this allows a local government to use excess permit funds that are prohibited from being carried forward to upgrade technology, hardware, and software systems to enhance service delivery. Now in previous uh, changes to the law, it restricted building departments from being able to carry forward a certain amount or, or an unlimited amount of carryover funds. Uh, so this kind of makes a, an exception that if you have excessive carryover funds from permits, you are allowed to use them as long as you earmark them for technology, hardware, and software upgrades. Uh, so this may be useful. I guess, you know, part of this is to get everybody to you know automate and get uh, information on their websites and to process uh, uh, information uh, electronically. Next slide, please. In section seven, uh, this is a change to the thermal efficiency standards for unvented attic and unvented enclosed rafter assemblies. Uh, this is a new section under part five of chapter 553. 
Uh, it basically determines an equivalency that certain methods for insulating attics are equal to the provision of the energy conservation volume in section R402, building thermal on the envelope, which is the residential section. The equivalency is established in the following, if the following conditions are met. The building has a blower door test. Next slide, please. The building has a blower door test resulting in less than three air changes per hour at 50 pascals. The building has a positive input ventilation system or a balanced or hybrid whole house mechanical ventilation system. And of course, this is this is due to the fact that you have uh, uh, three air changes or less, which requires outside air. If insulation is installed under the roof deck, the exposed portion of the rafter must be insulated with at least an R3 air impermeable insulation, unless directly covered by a finished ceiling. Uh, and further, if a continuous insulation is installed above the roof deck, the rafters do not need to be insulated. And all equipment and ductwork inside the, it must be inside the building thermal envelope. And lastly, uh, in section seven, uh, this modifies 5539065, and the building, the Florida Building Commission has tasked with review was tasked with reviewing and considering this section and any technical changes necessary and report findings to the legislator by December 31st of 2024. Now the commission has already uh, commissioned a study on this topic and is expected to submit this report at the end of the year. And with that, that concludes the review of House Bill 267. Uh, back to you, Ron. Okay, thank you. And I hope you hear me better now. I had a comment that uh, apparently my mic was a little close to my base from that standpoint. And now Stephanie Rossi, who is our vice chair, she is going to take over and handle the next portion of our bill's review. Stephanie, you ready? I am, Ron. Okay. We're going to start with uh, Senate Bill 1526, which is local regulation of non-conforming and unsafe structure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the local regulation on non-conforming and unsafe structures. Uh, it's kind of funny because up here in Citrus County, I don't have any properties that are affected by the coastal control construction line. So I had to do some homework on this one before putting this presentation together. So um, these provisions took effect upon coming law, becoming law, and that was signed uh, by the governor and it went into effect on March 22nd of this year. Go ahead. Okay. So the purpose of this is the local regulation of non-conforming and unsafe structures. It designates the Resiliency and Safe Structures Act, which by the way, is actually um, now going to be added to the Florida statutes under section 553.8991. Uh, this prohibits local governments from prohibiting, restricting, or preventing the demolition of certain structures and building unless necessary for public safety prohibiting local governments from imposing additional lo local land development regulations or public hearings on permit applicants and requiring a local government to authorize replace structures to be developed in accordance with certain regulations. Okay. Okay. This applies to any structure or building on a property at least partially seaward of the coastal construction control line which has been determined to be unsafe or ordered demolished by a local building official or does not conform to the base flood elevation requirements for new construction issued by the NFIP National Flood Insurance Program for the applicable zone. A local government may only administratively review an application for a demolition permit for compliance with safety codes and regulations applicable to a similarly situated parcel. The local government may not impose additional local land development regulations or public hearings on an application for a demolition permit under this bill. Okay. The bill does not apply, however, to structures or building individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places, single family homes, contributing structures or buildings within a historic district, which was listed in the National Register of Historic Places before January 1, 20, 
2000, excuse me, or structures or buildings located on a barrier island in a multiple municipality with a population of less than 10,000, according to the most recent decennial census, and which has at least six city blocks that are not located in zones V, VE, AO, or AE, as identified in the flood insurance rate map issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Thanks. The bill provides that the local government must authorize replacement structures for qualifying buildings to be developed to the maximum height and overall building size allowed for a similarly situated parcel within the same zoning district. The bill prohibits a local government from imposing certain restrictions and limitations on a replacement structure to be built on the property where a qualifying structure was demolished. <clears throat> the bill also includes a preemptive pre preemption provision that prohibits a local government from adopting or enforcing a law that in any way limits the demolition of a qualifying structure or that limits the development of a replacement structure. A local government may not penalize an owner or developer of a replacement structure or otherwise enact laws that defeat the intent of this bill. Any local government law uh, contrary to this bill is void. So as I was doing some research, I had to really dig into this because, like I said, I have not dealt with the coastal control construction line in a lot of years. So I found a couple really good resources. Um, if you go to the DEP website, um, they actually have the whole breakdown of the coastal control construction line program. There's about uh, quite a few links. This is just a snapshot at the top. The page is quite extensive. So pretty much anything that you may need, you probably can find on this website. Um, the next slide is a continuation of that. As far as even getting into your permit application guidance. I also went in and uh, went to the bill analysis and fiscal, what's it called? Sorry, here, hang on. And I found that this had a lot of good information. It's right in the Florida Senate website when you put the house bill number in it'll take you to the bill analysis and fiscal impact statement so there's a, a lot of really in-depth information that was just way too much to try to get into here today but um you know one of the big things is that i found in this is that the definition of coastal control the, co the coastal construction control line defines the portion of the beach dune system that is subject to severe fluctuations caused by a 100-year storm surge, storm waves, or other forces such as wind, wave, or water level changes. DEP establishes CCC outlines on a county basis along the sand beaches of the state fronting on the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Straits of Florida. Um, they actually have an interactive map that you can go in and look up by address. So. Hopefully those are some, some helpful hints to, to help you out with this. And that is all, Ron. And you had mentioned that there was one change with regard to the coastal patrol line now being transferred over to them with regard to a de better definition of what is the proper areas to be concerned with as far as flood and also, I guess, to uh, interact with the FEMA? Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Welcome. And guess what? You guys get to have me. So there's two bills that we're going to touch on here. And give me one sec to switch this over. And of course, we have Senate Bill 1142, which is a continuation of our soap opera on local licensing. Uh, as we all know, uh, they have tried twice to get this correct. And with this update, which was signed by the governor on May 29th, what has occurred is that effective July the 1st, DBPR and CILB are given the authority because, as defined by statute, they are allowed to use the existing local license as a way to transfer those people over to the new category. And the requirements are that they have to have the local licenses. DBPR is going to uh, buy the CI will be adopting the new regs 
create the forms required, which are to be available no later than January the 1st, and then defining the process, be able to recognize the local license. Meanwhile, what happens is that the local license, the validity of the local licenses are extended through July the 1st, 2025. So this will give the currently licensed local specialty contractors, let's say for overhead doors, windows, and all those other cute little things that have been created by the state cat under the state categories currently, the ability to remain legal. And they have six months between January the 1st through the end of June, so they'll be legal by July the 1st of next year, and then they will have their state license. What's the practical effects? Of course, it resolved the issue. One of the things that DBPR through the CILB attorney found out was, yes, we can create the categories, but we do not have the authority to recognize the local licenses as valid for our purposes. Uh, what would have happened was that if you went and applied, you had to go through all the process, including examinations, uh, background checks, uh, the, the, the whole rigmarole, which is not pertinent to people that are already qualified in the local level. So this gave them the authority to, to have that process. It extended the recognition of the current licensees to protect them. And also what will happen is DBPR will include the information on the licensees in the database on a state level. This will include the usual information of who the firm is, the qualifier, who is the qualifier, insurance requirements, all that other good stuff. So the local jurisdictions will be able to check for those specialty permits by consulting the DBPR database on the state level. Now, the license holder who applies and has issued the new state-level license will have portability within the state. So, for example, if you have a currently local licensed specialty contractor in Sarasota County that wants to work over in Hillsborough County, or he wants to work over in Duval County, or in Miami-Dade County, he will be able to do that without any additional requirements as far as their license to pull that particular permit, specialty permit. Of course, the local license holders will have to apply before July the 1st to get that state license in their category. Uh, since the new updated form will be available, the application form will be available by January the 1st, I would spread the gospel to all those local licensees to make sure that they check up on the DBPR website and as soon as practical after on or after that date, get their paperwork in, which can be done electronically. And that way they can get the process and get it issued and they're not behind the eight ball. Now, what are the requirements? Because they're gonna ask you those questions. Applicant must have a local license in the category, that is the created state category that was issued in either 2021 2022 or 2023. They will have to complete the application and there will be a nominal fee. They will have to supply a copy of the local licensing that matches the category. They will have their certificate of insurance, obviously, that will be required. The qualifier information and some related data that EBPR will have with regards to some sampling, etc. But there will be no testing required of those applicants under those categories. Now we're going to move to one other bill, which is one of my favorites as far as why did they do this. And this is Senate Bill 382 with regards to continuing education. Now this was slightly debated, uh, and that's an undertone comment. It was signed by the governor on May the 16th. It becomes effective July the 1st. In other words, it became effective about 10 days ago. It revises requirements on which professions will be required to complete continuing education. Those exempted must complete continuing education requirements set by the board. So there's a little bit of a deal here. If you don't get exempted under this bill, you still, you, you do not have to complete the continuing education requirements. If you're exempted, you have to complete 
your education requirements as defined by your board. So what, what uh, more common uh, categories have been exempted? Doctors, architects, engineers, licensed construction contractors. The sunset requirement also kicks in if you have a selected license category. In other words, if you have had a license issued on a particular specialty, which is 10 or more years without any administrative issues, you are no longer required to have continuing education requirements. Now, the question was raised, and this is something that will be clarified, but let's say that you have more than one license. Let's say, for example, you are a general contractor, you also are a master electrician, you have state licenses for both. As a general contractor, you've been doing this for 15 years, you haven't been dinged, gee, you don't have to have any more continuing education. However, if your master electrician license is only has been valid for seven years, you still have to have continuing education on it. Unfortunately, those that are under BCAP, as far as the uh, inspectors, building officials, et cetera, are not exempted, which means that if you have 10 or more years, you are technically not required to have any continued education requirement. Impact. The BCAP regulated categories are not exempt. However, there is no provision of your local employer, employer requiring continued education as part of your employment. So if you work for a jurisdiction and it says, we don't really care, you have to have 24 hours of continued education in these categories, and you must complete it, you have to do it. CILB categories are exempt. Continued education requirements continue for license reasons. As I mentioned, uh, it includes contractors, architects, engineers. Of course, architects, engineers have separate boards, but would they be more current than inspectors? Which is one of the things that was raised when this bill was going through. Are we actually going to have better educated architects, engineers, contractors? Please don't laugh about the architects and the engineers and the contractors being more educated than the inspectors. But that currently could be happening. So that is one of the issues that we have taken under our list of things that we must have a conversation with with the legislature. And with that, we are coming up on our Q&A session. And there are already several questions in here, so I am going to thing here and open up the Q&A. And some were already answered. Uh, I'm going to go through some of them to share them. Like one of the questions asked was House Bill 267, Section 4, Subsection 20, is BOAF going to assist in the means and methods for the audit process? And the answer, uh, Sergio, you want to kind of answer that verbally? I know you I, did it. I, absolutely. That I, I think the executive committee of BOAF can certainly task one of its committees to to perform, to develop that form. Um, I think it would be a, a, a great uh, thing to do because uh, uh, all the building departments can rely on it and provide a, a certain level of consistency as to what auditing is uh, across the state. So uh, I, think the, I think that would be a, a good thing to do. On the same vein, the question was asked about if, if we do develop, will we share that also both for the staff, i.e. your internal staff, as well as for the private providers. And I guess that it's almost a similar question, but there was a conversation with regards to the differences in both the structures and the expectations. Could you touch on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the statute calls for auditing private providers, for a building official to audit a private provider. And, and it does provide certain parameters. Are they performing, you know, how they're performing their inspections? I believe that every building department should have a quality assurance program for their own inspectors. However, that doesn't measure the same that you would measure for a private provider. It's it's potentially two different uh, quality assurance. So the same document may not be used for your internal staff. Um, you know that could be used for private providers. I believe the measures would be different. Uh, what would constitute the audit parameters? 
may also vary uh, between your internal staff and those of a private provider. So since the statute kind of doesn't recognize the differences, would it be incumbent in the document itself to explain that there's two different metrics because it's two different types of organizations, but where they are parallel and where they differ because government has one set of tasks that it must answer to its local uh, governance as well as the state and the one that the private providers are not part of a, of a local governance? Yeah, absolutely. I think a government could depict uh, the differences between uh, both type of uh, audits and quality assurance. Okay, thank you. And then we have under, so let's see, the next question, section 4553.791, audits posted online. And the question is, is this to imply deficiencies or complaints against the private provider as a result of the audit too? And I would say that no, it is not. However, you answer it, and I think this is very important about the fact that this would be public information. So could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, remember that all that is public information. And I think that when you audit, you, de you need to identify what triggered the audit. In my mind, it could be one of three things. Uh, it could have been based on a complaint that the building official received. It could be based on a life safety condition that was found on one of those uh, site visits that could uh, trigger an audit, or it could simply be, you know, that it's it's selected out randomly, that uh, the building official uh, has a program that selects uh, at random a private provider to audit. Uh, so I think it's important to identify why the audit was triggered and what was the result of the audit. Okay, yeah. Now, I know that one part of the question was with regards to, and I guess it said about a complaint, but that would be mentioned in the audit report and if the complaints were resolved, or would that be something outside the scope of the audit, do you think? I know, I know that would be your opinion because it's not a document that we can point to. Yeah, I think you, you receive a complaint and that triggers the audit. Um, so I, I think that you could say it was just complaint based. Obviously, there may be uh, additional information that where the complaint came from, what was the complaint. Again, all that is public information, but does it need to be, does it need to constitute the results of the audit? Uh, I believe that would be up to each individual building official to determine that. It could be just be, you can just state the trigger. Um, or you can go into details as to what the trigger was. Okay, thank you, Sergio. And then, uh, how are building officials proposing to monitor all these time frames? And he comments in his experience with a variety of permitting softwares, these time frames can be programmed, but it's not an easy task, and it gets expensive to accomplish. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to revert back to old spreadsheets. So, I guess the answer is, I guess it all depends upon the particular time frame. Uh, and how you can program it into your software. And then the issue of identifying building plan reviews from other agencies who are not under the time frames that are applicable under the statute. And I think here, and I think you'll agree with me, Sergio, one of the things that we have, I think we pounded di this to, I don't know how simpler we can make it, but the building department and the permit issuance are the last step in the process, not the first step. And that this has to be clarified in some way, shape, or form that the time frames kick in once you have all the other approvals where you cannot issue that permit. Even, even the certification here under the statute that says that the architect or the engineer can put it under seal, it does not give them the authority to override all the other steps. And would you like to expand a little bit on yeah, absolutely. That and that would be the case that this does apply to the building department reviews and not an outside agency. However, for many years we've been promoting the one-stop shop and the concurrent process so that things can move along at the same at the same time and not in series. Uh, you know, this is where having a software that kind of monitors the ins and outs of reviews from the various trades is helpful. However, if a department doesn't have such as such as an aid, 
you know, how do you account for that? And, and, and does it need to resort to, as Ron says, that the building department reviews last once everything else is approved, you know, then here comes the plans to the building department. And now you can, you know, a date in and a date out. However, that gets into another vicious, vicious cycle as if you're now dealing with plans that have been approved by other agencies. What if those, what if some of those pages are not approved because they have to undergo, you know, reworks and changes. What does that do for the other approvals from other agencies? Does it have to go back to them and on and on and on? So it's not a simple uh, solution, uh, but certainly one that, you know, needs to be considered carefully. And of course, having software uh, is greatly uh, aids the building department in monitoring those timeframes. Now, this is my question. It's not up there, but do you think we need to almost like create a flow, flow chart people to have and post it on, you know, on like 44 point type and say, this is the flow, you start here, we're at the end, you have to go through all of this and all we're doing is helping helping you have a one stop, but all these other guys have to sign off first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think every building department at one time or another has developed such a workflow so they understand what the flow of the process is. And I think that, you know, uh, advertising it, uh, you know, makes the applicant aware of what the expectations are for the process to undertake, what the timeframes are for each, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, and understand, does the building department integrate with other agencies or are they separate? Okay, thank you. And the question was raised here and Stephanie answered it very well, but I just want to recap it for others. The question was, how are local specialty licenses which have no state category to be handled, for example, a framing contract. And as Stephanie said, she cited the different specialty types of licenses which were created under the previous legislation. And Stephanie, you wanna kind of comment on that real quick? Sure, um, when I saw that question, I had to jump on DBPR website because I know I saw it somewhere, right? <laughs> so I found it actually under DBPR under the construction industry hot topics. That's where that's where it's uh, mm -hmm. down a few lines because it looks like most of the stuff that they're addressing like House Bill 481 about the air conditioning, uh, mechanical building contractors. Um, so it, they have some, um, some good information. So if it's not something that you look at yeah. frequently, you might want to look at, but uh, basically they have created the 13 categories below the structural aluminum screen closure specialty contractor. Mm -hmm. They got into marine, like one, two, what, three, four, four of them. Yeah. Um, masonry, pre-stressed concrete, solar, um, structural steel, and at the bottom, the structural carpentry specialty contractor, which would be the framing one. Right. So the answer is, if it's one of those, you can transfer. If it's not there, I'm sorry, but you may have to see if we can add the category later, which would have to be done by legislation. So they are out of luck, there isn't one. And we're gonna to go to some of the open ones. And uh, John, your question, are the local license submitted to the state remain voluntary? No, they are now licensed categories, so they're not no longer classified as voluntary. Uh, and 382 is basically moved in Florida since all of this has to participate in the BCEGS program. There is a conflict, and this is one of the things that we're going to use as an explanation to the legislature at the next session why this was not a good idea on their part. So again, we're going to try to educate them. Uh, okay, yes, if it's not under the session. There was a question, is the building department, are the building departments required to also have procedures related to self audit due to the fact that we have audit procedures for private providers? The answer is yes. So you have to have a written audit guide. And as we discussed with Sergio before, because the departments have different QA issues, especially uh, under other certifications, which are outside of what the statute is talking about, you're going to have to explain the differences. That was part of the conversation that we had with Sergio here a minute ago. 
Uh, okay. Do you know if the Florida Attorney General's Office has issued an opinion on Florida Statute 553791 sub 10? 10 business days, building official must issue permit. If it excludes other department review and approval times, for example, uh, planning, storm water, fire, et cetera. It's too, it's too young of a bill, so I would say, and I'm not going to be 100% sure, but I would say 99%, it's too young for the AGO to have issued an opinion. However, sir, here you want to kick in? Sorry, I was trying to answer another question, Ron. Which one are you on? Keith Ellis, uh, the one on okay. uh, the AGO on the 10 business day, and I think part of the crux is not if they issued it, but regarding the thing we had discussed about what about if the other sign offs are in there can they can they legally issue a permit so in chapter one it says that a building official cannot issue a permit uh you know obviously for based on the building code or other local laws and ordinances so if your local laws and ordinance require say an environmental approval or a state approval and that's part of your uh permit process then you can cite that that you are, are you 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 are waiting for the approvals of outside agencies that are not within your control. So that would be part of you just go back to chapter one and say, hey guys, guess what? This other one supersedes you because I cannot do that if I don't have fire or I don't have uh, storm water or whatever that is also required as a condition of issuing the permit. And I guess that Giselle, I guess that asked, uh, what are the departments? See, are, I guess all those that you cited, it's the same thing. If you don't, if you're required to have a sign off and it's not there, you cite those and say, I, you know, your plan may be fine. Everything on my end is fine, but until you have those sign offs, I cannot issue a permit because I'm not allowed to. And well, yeah. yes, ma'am. Yes, Stephanie, go ahead. I have spoken with several other building officials on this topic um, throughout the conference and just in uh, casual. And one of the big things is the departments that are outside of our control. We mm -hmm. are all kind of looking at potentially removing those from um, our system and having them go directly and get those uh, approvals prior and having to submit those with their building permits. Um, so. That might be an option for others. And also I did pull up the attorney general opinions and the last one was done on October 30th, 2023. So there is not one published at this time. Thank you. Not that I expected one because I know she is really good at these things, but I didn't think she was that fast, especially since the, the, the statute is, uh, is so new and kind of still dangling out there. Um, so what you're saying, I know that this conversation has been around for several, I would say almost a year with regard to discontinuing one-stop shopping. And it's kind of sad that that may have to take effect, but that is unfortunately an option for departments to do. Say, you have to have the sign-offs because before you even submit the application, which I think is going to tick a few people off. Any other, I have one more, hold on a second, and then we're going to, uh, under Senate Bill 382, BCAB qualified licensees are exempt. DBPR already shows licensing to meet qualifications have no CEUs to meet this because still require 14 hours every two years for everyone to be monitored. The BCAB, I don't, I have not looked at BCAB's website. So BCAB may be behind the eight ball, but typically this does not require if you have a valid license that you have held continuously for 10 or more years and you have had not had any actions against it in that period of time, then you are technically not required to have any other continuing education. That's what the bill states. If you have a, let's say you have an inspector's license and you only had it for seven years, you still have to take continuing education. Will this be further clarified by BCAB? Yep. Uh, how is it going to be monitored? Do you mean the current stuff? If you're less than 10 years, you have to have it. You'll have to show it to them. Now, remember, your department may require that you show conformance to having taken to continuing education 
if it's part of the criteria for your continual employment. Two different animals. There is no uh, prohibition by the statute as to your employer requiring continuing education, so please do not use that if your employer says you have to have it. And we're going to take one more question or two, and then we're going away. Uh, sir, uh, Vince, I have no idea what the 105.3.1 is about. Okay, it's application. Okay, thank you, Vince. All right. Okay, it's more of a comment versus a question. So thank you, Vince, with regards to that. Uh, we are coming up on the hour, and in order to complete, I am going to go ahead and do the wrap-up. Excuse me one second. I've got to hit the magical arrow here. Closing items. There is a handout which was uh, sent to all those that registered. Uh, if you did not get a copy, please email Celeste or the BOAF general mailbox, and they will make sure you get a copy of it. It's a PDF of the slides themselves. Verify that you have supplied the complete information in your registration for your education credit. Part two of the webinar series, which will take uh, about another five or six bills in which we're still putting together, is going to be held next Thursday, July the 18th. It will be the same time frame, beginning at 2.30. We'll estimate it our one hour of duration. You can register for the session at www.boaf.net. You have some more questions, you forgot about it, you're trying to write it down and we're out of time email the legislative committee via the BOAF website. I gave the link right there, which is kind of long, so hopefully you have the you have the PDF and you're just able to copy and put it in. Put the comments there and we will be happy to address it. Uh, allow us a day or two to be able to do it, but we will answer all questions that are submitted in that manner. Now, we're almost right on the money, so thank you all for attending. Uh, we hope this has been useful. Uh, we hope that this starts conversations on certain items that we may be needing to fine tune with our wonderful legislatures up in Tallahassee as they convene in 2025. Uh, on behalf of BOAF, on behalf of Sergio and Stephanie, who have put a lot of work into this to get it all put together, and Celeste, who has been kind of shepherding us along, as well as Ann and Glenn and a whole bunch of people on the board. Thank you very much for attending. We hope to see you next week, and please keep your questions going, and we look forward for your support as we discuss other issues that may be of interest. Thank you very much, and Celeste, it's all yours. Thank you all. Thank you all. There, there will be a survey at the end. Please fill it out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.